I grew up with all my family around. We made music on the porch on Sunday nights. Home in with old guitars, broken Winston lights. Sorry. Whole women harmonizing with the wind. Singing softly to the Savior like a friend. They taught me how to sing the words and make the I'm still singing like that gray speckled bird. I hope you find something to love, something to do when you feel like giving up. A song to sing or a tale to tell. Something to love and I'll serve you well. Tonight we're laying on a blanket in the yard. Wind is cold, the sky is dark, the ground is hard. But your mama loves to count the stars at night. So if I get a little chill, then that's all. Summer day we turned you loose and tried to stay out of your way. I don't quite recognize the world that you call home. Just find what makes you happy, girl, and do it till you're gone. Well, here's your official welcome, post-prelude, pre-service. Uh, it's great to see everybody. Um, we hope you find a place of comfort, a place of familiarity, a place of peace, a place of meditation. But more than anything else, we hope you find a place of belonging, because you do. Uh, and on that note, let's stand, if we're able, and sing our opening refrain, One Love. One Love. Keep singing together. Our opening song is Send Us Your Spirit. The words are on the bulletin if you grabbed it on the way in, but also on the screen.
Amen. We come here every Sunday praying for God's Spirit to fill our to fill our lives and to renew the earth. Thankful for this gift of promise. The peace of God be with you all. Please share a sign of peace to those around you. Peace, peace, peace. So good to see you all. Peace, peace, peace. Welcome, welcome. Great to have you. Thank you so much for being with us. And a big welcome to those of you on the Zoom camera as well. We're having a glorious, beautiful day here. So we hope that, hope that wherever you are, that the sun is shining on you as well. Thanks for your presence. And as always, we're super thankful to have Shelly Carmen Brown singing with us too. And of course, Alex as well. So glad to have you and everyone with us. We want to be sure we know that you're here. So please pass the green books down and then pass them back so you can see who you are sitting by. If you've got a joy or concern, please note that. And everyone on Zoom, please let us know you're here on the chat so we can see that too. And if you've got joys or concerns as well, um, it's good to see. We've got some folks who've been gone for a long time. Mary Zimmerman's been away and uh, Minnesota is now back and the Penlands have been traveling everywhere. Judy said she zoomed in last week from Croatia and it's kind of like infirmary day here. Those of you who are here, we've got Lisa back there with the knee scooter and then David just had his knee surgery and then that was my knee scooter at one time. So I'm very glad I never want it back in my basement. You know, let somebody else enjoy that next time. And Rocky had surgery too on his hand and Meredith Murray is home recovering from surgery. So we're thinking of her and wishing all of those people um, healing of body and mind. And of course, our Liz Donnelly took a nasty fall yesterday, and we're glad that she's with us and able, even with the black eye and the sore leg. And of course, we think of this huge global world of which we are a part in places, especially the Middle East, where the suffering just continues so intensely. And keep praying for diplomatic solutions. And we have so many joys to celebrate. Gail Oliphant is back. Gail, Gail moved away a year ago to be with her mother and her mother of 98 passed in July. And so super delighted that you made it back last week. And we're so, so thankful to have you back with us. Um, we're going to celebrate Lola Finley's baptism next week. I saw Lola just slip in a minute ago. And Leo Vacuna earned his Eagle Scout. So we're proud of him. I think you all know that this guy here was the one millionth Eagle Scout, and it was, it was presented to him by none other than Ronald President Reagan. Ronald Reagan. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So, with the, with the, the blood, wonders the never cease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Anyhow, and Ash Verberg and Sky Tamsin were married yesterday, kind of officially. They'd kind of been married officially, but had the celebration yesterday. So many things to celebrate, and um, all the things that we're all bringing and carrying too as well. And this morning, we're going to he hear a lesson that's just really kind of a delightful short story, but it's about Jesus meeting Bartimaeus, the blind beggar. And there's a sweet line in there where Jesus says to Bartimaeus, what can I do for you? And Jesus has just said that to James and John, what can I do for you? And many of you have heard me say this, that that's kind of a great go-to line when you're with anybody, they're struggling, they're hurting, whatever is, what can I do to support you, right? Not can I do anything, but what can I do? And my friend who runs a big organization development, she gets teams together and, you know, this is the person and you just go around, everybody asks them, what can I do to support you? What can I do to support you? What can I do? And keep going deeper. And so that's in some ways our intention this week is to think, you know, what can we do to support one another? And, and also how can we accept support? And, and that that support being a way that we can leave the old that we need to leave behind and go in fresh new ways, not just for us, but for our world as well. So that's kind of our intention this morning that we'll be thinking about as we sing our call to prayer. We are going to a place where music falls and fills us.
Holy One, we thank you for the beauty of a fall morning, for the comfort and predictability of the changing seasons, for fiery red and orange leaves on the trees and the crisp, cool air on our skin. As we admire the beauty of your world, we also acknowledge our complicity in the damage that we've done to it, from a changing climate to catastrophe catastrophic wars with unending human casualties, to divisive and uncompromising politics, to dehumanizing policies that would prefer to shelter money over people. Our community here strives for peace, meanwhile fighting for justice. But we need your help. We need your strength, your encouragement, and your hope. Cause us to hold on to serenity during this confusing, chaotic, and combative time. When times seem hopeless, we may think ourselves too small or too powerless to make any difference, but we must band together, fight, march, pray, call, give, encourage, and love one another even harder. We pray for wisdom, strength, and most of all, peace. We pray for healing of our mental and physical health, wisdom for our leaders, encouragement for the weary, hope for the downtrodden, and peace for a world that is quite literally holding its breath. Amen. Amen. Kelly, thank you so much for the beautiful prayer. So the gospel writers, if you think about it this way, there were these stories about Jesus that probably traveled independently before the gospels were written down. Remember, we're in Mark, through the rest of ordinary time. That's why we got our green on, and then Advent, we'll switch to Luke. But Mark was the first written. So the gospel writers or editors, they would take these stories and they would piece them together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they, the order they put them in sometimes was they were trying to make a point. So in Mark's gospel, which is the shortest, there's this section, kind of chapter 8, 9, and 10, where Jesus three times predicts his death. Three times says, you know, if you want to save your life, you're going to have to lose it. If you want to be first, you've got to be last. And he frames that with two stories of healing someone that is blind. So the first one was back in chapter 8. Remember that kind of story? It's kind of a colorful one where there's the guy who's blind and Jesus spits on the ground and he takes the mud and wipes it in the guy's eyes and he says, what do you see? And the guy says, I see people walking around, but they look like trees. And so then Jesus has to kind of do over. You know, he doesn't quite, you know, give you another shot. So then Jesus does it again and then the man can see. And then there's the predictions of the passion. And then now this ending of it is kind of the bracket is Jesus healing another man who's blind. And this time Jesus just speaks and the man is healed. But Mark frames it that way as kind of a contrast of saying these two people who we think can't see really can see when the disciples who are right there with Jesus seem confused and are still, you know, trying to banter back and be in the top position. And remember last week we had the rich man who didn't want to leave, didn't want to follow, didn't want to let go. So this kind of contrast. So it's a short, it's a short pericope is the word for that, but it's a really, it's a lovely story about Bartimaeus, who is one of our saints. They, kind of like Jesus and the disciples, came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside, sitting by the way is the Greek. When Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly rebuked him, ordered him to be quiet. The Greek is actually rebuked. But he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, take courage, really get up. He is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, Bartimaeus sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? All right, what can I do to support you? And the blind man said to him, my teacher, or Rabboni, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, Bartimaeus regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. 
So she was freezing, like literally, not just emotionally frozen, but sitting in her cold, dark house. It was like 20-something years ago, those of you, especially if you lived in Brookside, we had this massive snowstorm in October. Do you anybody remember? And there were all the leaves, the trees still had all their leaves, and the big snow, big, wet, heavy snow, and all those beautiful branches snapped, and all those power lines in Brookside above, the, above you know, snapped too. And we were eight days without power. And it was so tricky because the little kids didn't have school because there was no power at the school but all the adults were working and I still remember like the trauma of that I mean in a tiny way I remember thinking like being a refugee I mean like you I mean this is nothing like that but you couldn't do anything you couldn't accomplish anything besides just trying to keep the kids safe and sheltered right and by like day three or four like most of us had like found somebody with power or found a hotel and everybody was crashed together but not this friend I have known her all my life, and she was in her big, large, beautiful Brookside home just all by herself in the dark cold. And I remember going over there, and she just literally could not move. I mean, there had been a divorce that had been unexpected. There had been a complicated death of her mother. And she just, she had been talking about from 3,200 square feet to a garage apartment, friend we had in Austin who was welcoming her, but she just couldn't move. Now, we can all identify, right, how hard it is to let go and to shed. We talked about last week, remember the rich man, he has, he has everything, right? Says to Jesus, what do I need to do? And Jesus says, oh, just sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he is like, no interest in that, no interest in shedding, no interest in lightening his load. And we can identify, right, even though Jesus has told us how hard it is to get into heaven, right? It's like, you know, a camel trying to get through the eye of the needle. A camel in those days, remember, was the U-Haul, right? That is what it is. So it's like, even though we know all this stuff that we carry around with us, all the emotional and physical stuff we could really let go of, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to let go. But today, we meet the patron saint of letting go of your old life and moving on to your new life. And that is Bartimaeus. So in this short little story, Bartimaeus is this blind beggar and he's sitting beside the way. He is in Jericho and the scripture tells us that Jesus comes into Jericho and then the next sentence it says, oh, they leave Jericho. It's kind of a strange little thing. And Bartimaeus evidently is like, well, time is of the essence. They're not going to be here very long. So Bartimaeus hollers out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. People rebuke him, tell him to be quiet, just like they had rebuked the people who brought the little children to Jesus. But Bartimaeus just calls out again, Son of David, have mercy on me. And then the scripture says Jesus stood still. He just like stops and he looks and he says, call him. And so the scripture says now the crowd who had just rebuked him says to Bartimaeus, take courage, get up, he's calling you. They called him. So the word call is used there three times because, as it turns out, this is a call story. Jesus is calling Bartimaeus, just like Jesus called James and John and Simon and Andrew. And what Bartimaeus does here, it's kind of easy to skip. It says he threw off his cloak and he sprang up. I mean, like, well, he's just taking his cup. No, no, no. This, were, this was the tools of his trade. I mean, Bartimaeus is parked in the very best spot for a blind beggar. He's in Jericho, which is 15 miles from Jerusalem. It's where the pilgrims are passing through. It is a great place to catch people who are trying to do one more act of righteousness before they get to the holy temple, right? So this cloak that he throws down, it's like the, the fisherman's fishernet, right? It's the barber's scissors. It's the architect's drafting table. I mean, that is everything he has. He just throws it down and he springs up. The only place in all of scripture where anybody springs up, there's this kind of joy and energy. It's like, he's not sad to leave the old. He's ready. And he says, you know, he appears before Jesus and Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do? And he says, I want to see again. And the last time Jesus said, what do you want me to do it for you? It was James and John. And they said, we want to sit at your right hand and your left hand. We want to be Mr. and Miss Important, right? And so Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Go and see, right? And the man follows him along the way. So he goes from being beside the way to being on the way. It's kind of a simple little story, but it's a lot in there, a lot of wisdom. Like, I keep thinking about all the 30-something-year-olds I seem to know right now who can't seem to quite get their act together. And in this scripture, 
what's the first thing that happens? Bartimaeus takes the initiative, right? Bartimaeus calls out, and when they rebuke him, he calls out again. You know, anybody who's worked with someone who's drinking too much or won't get out of bed or whatever, what's the first thing that has to happen? A person has to decide, I'm going to get better, right? You can, you can just beat your head against the wall. But the person has to decide, I'm ready for something new. And then there's all the encouragement, right? Because now the crowd that has been fickle says, hey, take courage, get up, he's calling you. So then once a person has made a decision, I'm going to do it differently, then everybody else can pile in there and encourage and, and you know, you go, you go. And then the other thing that's kind of remarkable about this passage is the springing up, is the energy, is the kind of there's something in Bartimaeus that's like this irrepressible part that is in every human spirit, in every animal that kind of reaches towards the light, right? That reaches for something lively, something new, something hopeful, even in the toughest situations, kind of buried deep inside. And I've been thinking about that because I think we all know, you know, tricky time in our country, right? Did you just see that for the eighth year in a row, the United States was just named to the list of flawed democracies. We're not a failed democracy yet, but everybody knows, right, that elections are at risk and uh, the votes at risk, and we've got a Supreme Court that seems to be full of corruption and conflict of interest, and it's easy to despair. But then when you step back, you see these other places around the world where people are living really in dark cold, like literally in situations far less free than ours, where people are somehow finding a way to reach deep and spring up. Some of that's happening in Russia, of all places. If you follow the news, you probably saw the story Tuesday of Alexei Moskalyava. And it made me think about in February, do you all remember that Alexei Navalny, remember he's the guy who was Putin's main critic, the one who stood up to Putin the most, the one who was kind of like next in line to try to like possibly, possibly wedge and bring that country towards freedom. Do you remember he died, right? He'd been in prison for 37 months. No real surprise that he died because he'd been tortured and beaten and starved and frozen and poisoned. And none of these things are very helpful, right? So when he died and, you know, at 47, I mean, he knew the end was going to come. But do you remember the pictures that were in the news after that of all the people who bravely came forward just to lay a rose on his memorial? Does that, remember, does that ring a bell? You remember that like in 40 cities across Russia, like over 400 people were actually taken into custody, hauled off to some prison in Siberia for simply laying a rose on a memorial, right? I mean, that's a kind of, you know, oppression, repression we can't even imagine. And it hadn't, again, made a whole lot of news, but since Putin invaded Ukraine, there were like, in the first 18 months, 20,000 Russians, again, that were hauled off into detention for protesting. And one of those was a guy named Alexei Moskalyov, who was released on Tuesday. NPR covered it, and the Washington Post covered it. This guy, he sold birds, pet birds. That's what he did for a living. But he got in trouble when his 12-year-old daughter, Masha, after Putin, who let's also remember is being embraced by somebody running for president, after Putin decided that um, he was going to invade Ukraine, and this little girl, the 12-year-old Masha, in her class drew a picture of a mother with the Ukrainian flag sheltering her child from a Russian missile. And the principal told on the little girl, and the police came in, and the father was charged with incorrectly raising his daughter and sent to prison for two years for that, for his daughter, for his 12-year-old drawing a picture. And he didn't go easily. He was kind of his own Bartimaeus figure, right? Because he actually fled. He sprang up. He tried to make it to Belarus. And then he was found and he was brought back. He's been beaten and tortured and frozen. A horrible. And his daughter, he was a single father, was put in an orphanage for two years. So when he was released on Tuesday, even through the interpreter, I mean, you could just feel this person who was just bravely and courageously reaching for the light. I mean, he was going to live. He was going to live to get out and save his daughter. I mean, there was that initiative. And then 
If you ever wonder if Amnesty International and all those groups, you're like, oh, write this person and write this person who's a prisoner. He said he got so many letters, hundreds and hundreds of letters from Russia and America and France and England and Germany. He got so many letters that were in huge bags, he couldn't even bring them with them out of prison. And, and he talked about the joy of being reunited with his daughter. I mean, all of that. It was like this person who is determined in a situation of repression, we can't even begin to imagine, right, reaching for the light. And then there was also that young woman in August, barely made the news, Sasha Skochelenko. Skochelenko. Sasha was 33. And she's like a hippie, activist, guitarist, musician, lesbian. And um, her activism, as it were, began in 2019 when a friend asked her to go to Ukraine to help with the children's summer camp. And she loved it and enjoyed the kids and had such a good time. And then two and a half years later, when Putin invaded Ukraine, she was like, I just can't sit back on this. So she heard about a group of people that were resisting by taking tiny little stickers that like gave cost to the war, like how many Russians were being conscripted and how many people were being killed and put the stickers around. So she put five small stickers in a grocery store over, over little like price tags, five stickers, and she got seven years in prison for that, right? So she was released August 1 as a part of that big, it was a historic prison exchange between America and Russia, which again, we were all on vacation. But the thing that really made the news, remember the Wall Street Journal reporter who was released and that Paul Whelan, the Marine, those two kind of made the news, but there were other people like Sasha who was released. And she talked about what it had been like. She, as a lesbian, was put in a cell with 17 women who were told to assault her and then five women who were told to assault her. And she was just treated to the most barbaric treatment. She was also denied medicine that she needed. She developed a very difficult heart situation. But when she was released, the, Wall the Washington Post said, um, activist LGBTQ artist survives with her inner joy. And there was this picture of her flashing little heart symbol. And all through her detention and her trial, whenever she would be brought back to court, she would wear these psychedelic, which we think of as tie-dyed shirts, and she would smile and she would beam and she would flash this heart symbol. And then Russia decided that the heart symbol had to be banned. But when she came out and she was released and she was reunited with her girlfriend, they were reunited in Germany, she said, all I want to do is kiss my girlfriend and feel the grass under my feet and hug the trees and see the sun in the sky and live, right? Just this irrepressible joy. So I'm thinking right now about those people. I'm thinking about those people who really, really have a far different road in front of them. This is not the same thing, folks, right? We can go out there and we can say whatever the hell we want, right? Nobody's, I mean, this is still a free country. And I'm thinking, again, as a pastor, how privileged I am, so privileged to hear your stories all the time. Every time I sit down with someone for their birthday lunch or coffee, I always say, what are you going to do this year? And people tell me. You know, I'm going to try to take better care of myself. I'm going to try to be more engaged with my grandkids. I'm going to try to do this and that. And then I see people reaching out beyond the way people here are engaged in the community, the way people are not just voting but trying to get other people to vote. Liz Donnelly writing people through grandparents for gun safety because there's been enough people die. There have been enough people shot. It can't keep happening. We have a dozen people in this church writing cards and letters. Elizabeth Duke has written over 300 letters and over 1,000 postcards, and she's still at it, trying to get people to get out and vote and think about the way we can be in charge of our bodies and think about the way we can lift up the minimum wage. And I think about Kathy Schwamberger when she went out to visit her friends in Napa, which is a place that's safe from the total craziness generally, right? And those people, what are they doing? They're writing letters across the country. And so Kathy decided she would get involved. And so she's writing with a Turns out it's a largely group of Jewish women in New York, and they're sitting here writing letters to Jackson County, right? Like, they've never been here, but about some, you know, that's the thing, folks, right? I mean, people are canvassing and voting and stepping up and springing up and saying, you know what? We are going to leave the old hatefulness behind. We're going to step up and be new, fresh people. And it doesn't have to end, right? I mean, these groups, they're not just about the president. They're about every single school board race all across the country trying 
sign to take this country back and forward to a place of more equity and justice. When my friend finally thought out, she had that yard sale. I remember even at the moment, it was so hard for me to process. I had known her in Texas, known her here. All these treasures, I mean, beautiful treasures she had collected from all over the world and her children's treasures. And I just remember all across her yard and strangers coming and touching these things and for a quarter and 50 cents and a dollar just taking her life away. But a month or so later, she got in her little hatchback, tiniest little travel trailer behind her and pulled off into the horizon. This was a person free and fresh leaving the old behind, going to a new place. May our sweet Bartimaeus, and may Alexei and Sasha and may Liz and Elizabeth and Patty and all the people out there trying to make a difference, encourage us, open our hearts, our mind to see that not just this season, but every single day is an opportunity to show up in a fresh way, to think, who will I be today? What will I leave behind? What will I embrace? May it be so. Amen.
Nice job. So I think one of the things we all know is that sometimes the, you know, the momentum to go in a fresh new way comes from the most difficult, hurtful, painful things, right? We see it in our country. Sometimes the difficult things can be a way of us deciding we're gonna go forward in a fresh, new, good way. Sometimes the personal stuff like that can happen. Um, I think many of you know Crystal Mayberry. Crystal comes to worship some. She lived with us for a couple of years. She's a dear friend of um, Alex and Christy, student at UMKC, and Crystal was in a horrible car wreck a year ago, September 11th, that killed her date. And um, for a good bit of time, it was hard to know if Crystal was gonna live, and then it turned out Crystal was gonna live, and then there was you know, a long period of recovery in Nebraska, and then more um, you know, ongoing therapy, which will be with her for the rest of her life. But she's back in school, and um, her grades are better than they were before the wreck, and lots of positive things. And we were together this week, and I rem it made me think of something she had said when she was at research, she said, you know, the physical therapist, you know, like, because I'm a person who takes the initiative, and I just thought, you know, yes, you are, and she's gonna get better, and, and, but, and that's true, and there's been so much support, and she always tells me that. Please tell the people in the church how much I appreciate their support, financial and emotional and caring for one another, and that's just, I think, so much truth of who we are. Somehow, in every human heart, even a heart where there is no freedom and no opportunity, there is still something in us that reaches for the light and reaches for more and reaches for freshness. And we need that nurtured by those people around us too who say, take courage, get up, he's calling you, right? We need, we need that support from people who send us cards and letters and words of encouragement. And we need to keep trying to unthaw that joy that's deep inside of us. And that's, that's our calling as God's people. Sometimes we get just buried with the baggage and buried with the stuff that we're carrying. And so we come here every Sunday at this table and we just say, you know, I'm going to let go of that, right? Let go of that and receive something new. And so we remember that it was on the night of the betrayal that Christ Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, the cup after supper, saying this cup has been poured out for the forgiveness of all sins. Drink this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. God, who is always good, we remember that even in the most treacherous and uncertain of hours when Jesus was most keenly aware of plots to harm him, and the approach of immediate bodily threats, Jesus chose activism and caregiving. He still invited his followers to share in his table of grace. When time could surely be no worse, Jesus said, come join me, let us share a meal where even my betrayer is welcome. We thank you, Igniting Spark, for the example of Jesus that love can be larger than fear and trust can be larger than the unknown. Grateful to be invited unconditionally to this table today, we pray this holy prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come and feast. There's a blood red circle on the cold dark ground and the rain church doors thrown open, I can hear the organ song, but the congregation's gone, my city of I'm a 
Let us pray. A loving one, we give you thanks for this sacred community where we can come each week and breathe and believe the best in ourselves and in this world and in our calling to be your people of justice and generosity. May the communion that we have shared today and the hope and the love we feel in this gathering move us this, this week to be your people of grace and joy. All this we ask in your name. Amen.
Now may the one who calls us to get on the way to move towards hope and healing, new life, a new beginning, open our eyes to what is possible so that everywhere we go, we might be peace and wage peace and love one another. Every single other. Amen.